Pulling the harpo on her, he had thrown aside his black jacket and displayed his naked chest with the whole part of his body above the gunnel, clearly cut against the alternating depressions of the watery horizon, while at the other end of the boat Ahab, with one arm, like a fencer's, thrown half backward into the air, as if to counterbalance any tendency to trip, Ahab was seen steadily managing his steering or as in a thousand boat lowerings ere the white whale had torn him. All at once the outstretched arm gave a peculiar motion and then remained fixed, while the boat's five oars were seen simultaneously peaked. Boat and crew sat motionless on the sea. Instantly the three spread boats in the rear paused on their way. The whales had irregularly settled bodily down into the blue, thus giving a no distantly discernible token of the movement, though from his closer vicinity Ahab had observed it. Every man look out along his oars! cried Starbuck. Thou, Queequeg, stand up. Nimbly springing up on the triangular raised box in the bow, the savage stood erect there, and with intensely eager eyes gazed off towards the spot where the chase had last been descried. Likewise upon the extreme stern of the boat where it was also triangularly platformed level with the gunwale, Starbuck himself was seen coolly and adroitly balancing himself to the jerking tossings of his ship of a craft and silently eyeing the vast blue eye of the sea. Not very far distant Flask's boat was also lying breathlessly still, its commander recklessly standing upon the top of the loggerhead, a stout sort of post rooted in the keel, and rising some two feet above the level of the stern platform. It is used for catching turns with the whale line. Its top is not more spacious than the palm of a man's hand, and standing upon such a base as that, Flask seemed perched at the masthead of some ship which had sunk to all but her trucks. But Little King Post was small and short, and at the same time Little King Post was full of a large and tall ambition, so that this loggerhead standpoint of his did by no means satisfy King Post. I can see three seas off, tip us up and o'er there, and let me on to that. Upon this, Daggu, with either hand upon the gunnel to steady his way, swiftly slid aft, and then erecting himself volunteered his lofty shoulders for a pedestal. Good a masthead as any, sir. Will you mount? That I will, and thank you very much, my fine fellow, only I wish you fifty feet taller. Whereupon planting his feet firmly against two opposite planks of the boat, the gigantic negro, stooping a little, presented his flat palm to Flask's foot and then putting Flask's hand on his hearse-bloomed head and bidding him spring as he himself should toss, with one dexterous fling landed the little man high and dry on his shoulders. And here was Flask now standing, Daggoo with one lifted arm furnishing him with a breastband to lean against and steady himself by. At any time it is a strange sight to the Tyro to see with what wondrous habit you'd of unconscious skill the whale-man will maintain an erect posture in his boat even when pitched about by the most riotously perverse and cross-running seas. Still more strange to see him giddily perched upon the loggerhead itself, under such circumstances. But the sight of little flask mounted upon gigantic Dagu was yet more curious, for sustaining himself with a cool, indifferent, easy, unthought of, barbaric majesty, the noble negro to every roll of the sea harmoniously rolled his fine form. On his broad back, Flaxen hair flask seemed a snowflake. The bearer looked nobler than the rider. Though truly vivacious, tumultuous, ostentatious little flask would now and then stamp with impatience, but not one added heave did he thereby give to the negro's lordly chest. So have I seen passion and vanity stamping the living magnanimous earth, but the earth did not alter her tides and her seasons for that. Meanwhile Stubb, the third mate, betrayed no such far-gazing solicitudes. The whales might have made one of their regular soundings, not a temporary dive from mere fright, and if that were the case, Stubb, as his wand in such cases, it seems, was resolved to solace the languishing interval with his pipe. He withdrew it from his hat-band, where he always wore it aslant like a feather. He loaded it, 
and ran home the loading with his thumb end, but hardly had he ignited his match across the rough sandpaper of his hand, when Tashko, his harpal oneer, whose eyes had been setting to windward like two fixed stars, suddenly dropped like light from his erect attitude to his seat, crying out in a quick frenzy of hurry, down, down all, and give way. There they are. To a landsman, no whale, nor any sign of a herring, would have been visible at that moment, nothing but a troubled bit of greenish-white water, and thin scattered puffs of vapor hovering over it and suffusingly blowing off to a leeward, like the confused scud from white rolling billows. The air around suddenly vibrated and tingled, as it were, like the air over intensely heated plates of iron. Beneath this atmospheric waving and curling, and partially beneath a thin layer of water, also, the whales were swimming. Seen in advance of all the other indications, the puffs of vapor they spouted, seemed therefore on encouriers and detached flying outriders. All four boats were now in keen pursuit of that one spot of troubled water and air. But it bade fair to outstrip them, it flew on and on, as a mass of interblending bubbles borne down a rapid stream from the hills. Pull, pull, my good boys! said Starbuck, in the lowest possible but intensest concentrated whisper to his men, while the sharp fixed glance from his eyes darted straight ahead of the bow, almost seemed as two visible needles into unerring binnacle compasses. He did not say much to his crew, though, nor did his crew say anything to him. Only the silence of the boat was at intervals startlingly pierced by one of his peculiar whispers, now harsh with command, now soft with entreaty. How different the loud little king post! Sing out and say something, my hearties! Roar and pull, my thunderbolts! Beach me, beach me on their black backs, boys! Only do that for me, and I'll sign over to you my Martha's Vineyard Plantation, boys! Including wife and children, boys! Lay me on, lay me on! Oh lord, lord! But I shall go stark, staring mad! See! see that white water, and so shouting, he pulled his hat from his head, and stamped up and down on it, then picking it up, flirted it far off upon the sea, and finally fell to rearing and plunging in the boat's stern like a crazed colt from the prairie. Look at that chap now, philosophically drawled Stubb, who, with his unlighted short pipe, mechanically retained between his teeth, at a short distance followed after. He's got fits, that flask has. Fits? Yes, give him fits. That's the very word. Pitch fits into him. Merrily, merrily, hearts alive. Pudding for supper, you know. Mary's the word. Pull, babes, pull, sucklings, pull, all. But what the devil are you hurrying about? Softly, softly, and steadily, my men. Only pull, and keep pulling, nothing more. Crack all your backbones, and bite your knives in two. That's all. Take it easy. Why don't you take it easy, I say, and burst all your livers and lungs. But what it was that inscrutable Hap said to that tiger yellow crew of his, these were words best omitted here, for you live under the blessed light of the evangelical land. Only the infidel sharks in the audacious seas may give ear to such words, when, with tornado brow, and eyes of red murder, and foam-clued lips, a hab leaped after his prey. Meanwhile, all the boats tore on. The repeated specific allusions of Flask to, that whale, as he called the fictitious monster which he declared to be incessantly tantalizing his boat's bow with its tail, these illusions of his were at times so vivid and lifelike, that they would cause some one or two of his men to snatch a fearful look over the shoulder. But this was against all rule, for the oarsmen must put out their eyes, and ram a skewer through their necks, usage pronouncing that they must have no organs but ears and no limbs but arms, in these critical moments. It was a sight full of quick wonder and awe. The vast swells of the omnipotent sea, the surging, hollow roar they made, as they rolled along the eight gunnels, like gigantic bulls in a boundless bowling green, the brief suspended agony of the boat, 
as it would tip for an instant on the knife-like edge of the sharper waves, that almost seemed threatening. 